Good morning. My name is Joe Cerrone. I'm an attorney. I have an office in Annandale, Virginia. I do real estate law, including landlord-tenant issues. Today, I'm going to give a little talk about residential leases after COVID-19. Now, this presentation today is the first presentation since the change in the law. Uh, when I originally prepared this outline and I prepared this course, uh, we, I, I dealt with the change in the laws affecting residential leases in Virginia uh, resulting from COVID. And uh, you know, one of the most important was that they changed the five-day uh, notice for non-payment of rent to a 14-day notice for non-payment of rent. They also had a requirement that the landlords had to apply for rent relief on behalf of the tenants. Now, those laws expired on June 30th, 2022. Uh, they were not extended by the legislature. So right now, the situation that we are in, we are back to the five-day notice requirement and all requirements of prior law. Now, even with return to the prior law, there are some strategies every agent should consider when he or she is representing a landlord. And that is what we're going to discuss today. We're going to discuss these strategies. Now, one thing you should understand, you need to understand the residential lease market. Approximately 20% of the people that rent, they choose to rent. They could buy if they want, but they choose to rent. The remaining 80% have to rent. Uh, this means that many tenants can be financially challenged. In addition, rents are up. I mean, I think you've seen this on the news that the inflation has a, a impacted many issues in our lives, including rents. So one strategy that can be employed to, uh, to protect the landlord is a, a short lease, less than a year. Uh, the short lease can give the landlord some flexibility. If there is a tenant that they feel is a marginal tenant, that they're not sure that this tenant has is, is strong financially, they can give it a test run. They could do a 90-day lease, they could do a six-month lease, and you can have provisions in there that it's renewed as long as the tenant complies with all terms of the lease and they make all their payments. An another strategy is to make sure that you collect a sufficient security deposit. Uh, the Virginia Residential Landlord Tenant Act provides a landlord can hold up to two months, two months of uh, rent as a security deposit. You should try to do this. Uh, I will tell you as a practical matter, if you have to evict a tenant in Virginia, uh, when, you file your, uh, when you file your unlawful detainer, there's a four-week return. So it takes four weeks, and then there's a return date. On the return date, the landlord comes to court, and the tenant comes to court, and the court inquires of the tenant, do they owe the rent? If the tenant says he doesn't owe the rent, then they set it for trial. Now, they're supposed to set the trials on an expedited basis, but this takes at least two weeks. Okay, at the trial, if the landlord uh, wins, the landlord gets a judgment for possession and a judgment for rent and damages. Now, there's a 10-day period. There's a 10-day appeal period, so there's a 10-day period before the landlord can apply for a writ of possession. And once the landlord has the writ of possession, that goes to the sheriff, and then the sheriff can schedule an eviction. So it, it takes about, really, uh, two months to, to, to put someone out in Virginia. So if you have a two-month security deposit, you limit, the, uh, you limit the liability, the damages of the landlord. Another strategy is to make sure the lease contains the conditions that will constitute a material breach of the lease. And when I say material breach, there's two types of breaches. There's material breach, that means a serious breach of the lease, and there's non-material, which are minor breaches of the lease. 
So if you have a condition in your lease, for example, that the lawn has to be cut every two weeks and the, landlord and the, and the tenant doesn't do this, this is probably not considered a material breach of the lease and you're not going to be able to terminate the lease based on the a tenant's failure to comply with that term. Now, there's other terms that can be interpreted each, either way unless you specify in the lease that they're a material breach. Some examples are failure to have renter's insurance. A lot of the leases now have a provision that the tenant will maintain renter's insurance. Renter's insurance is a good thing. Uh, but a lot of times, you know, it's on the tenant to do it, they, they don't do it, they don't follow through. Uh, occupancy of premises by persons not on the lease. This is a big problem in Northern Virginia because of the high rents. Uh, a landlord rents a property that they think is being occupied by two or three people, and it turns out there's two or three families living in the property, rooms are rented. Uh, you, you need to specify that this will be a material breach of the lease if it's occupancy by persons that are not listed on the lease. Same with renting out rooms, uh, Airbnb, that's a big issue that I've had a number of uh, landlords come to me and say they, they got notices that their property is being rented on Airbnb. They don't want it to happen. Uh, you know, they didn't really specify it in the lease and uh, it can be an issue. Uh, now sometimes these terms, this these conditions that are going to constitute a material breach of the lease, they may have to be set out in an addendum to the lease. And an addendum is just, you know, as with addendum to a contract, it, it's a document that follows the lease and you can specify what is considered a material breach. Uh, the next strategy is to conduct initial walkthrough within five days of the start of the tenancy. This is provided in the NVAR form lease. And it's important to conduct this inspection with the tenant and, and the agent should be there. And a report should be made regarding the conditions of the property, uh, especially carpet, hardwood floors, etc. Photos should be taken. Uh, this is an uh, opportunity for the tenant to identify any mold present. And this is important too. If there is no mold present, it, well, if there is mold present, the landlord at that time can terminate the lease and has no further liability. If mold is determined uh, to be in the premises later on, it can be a problem for the landlord, it can be very costly because the landlord may have to put the tenant up in housing while the property is reme remediated. So uh, the other thing with regard to the report regarding the, the, the condition of the property is at the end of the lease. There's always disputes. Landlord says, oh, these hardwood floors are severely scratched. <clears throat> Tenant says, well, that's the way they were. Well, it's one word against the, one person's word against the other person. <coughs> if, you have, if you have a report that says carpet, new carpet in, in living room, and at the end of the lease that carpet is stained or damaged, the landlord can probably get the tenant to have to pay to replace the carpet. So it's important to identify these issues. Uh, the, another strategy is to clearly outline who is responsible for maintenance inside and outside the house. Specify in writing about the maintenance. Uh, some, some landlords use cost sharing or deductible and what that is, is a, uh, the, the provision in the lease that says the tenant is responsible for the first hundred dollars of any repair. Or on some things there's a 50-50 cost sharing. Uh, the, Maintenance provisions should specify the tenant must notify the landlord of any problem with the property and, that ca and, the, la and the tenant cannot unilaterally hire a contractor to do the repair. Now I, I will note the NVAR lease makes the landlord responsible for most repairs. So if you don't want to be responsible for most repairs, you have to have an addendum that says this is the, this is the situation with regard to repairs. Another point is to clearly state how notice may be delivered to the, to the tenant and the address to which notice may be sent. So, you know, today there's a lot of ways to uh, communicate. There's, you know, text messages, there's email, uh, U.S. Postal Service, Federal Express. So you need to specify that if you're going to use email, you can say that email is acceptable to provide notice and this is the email address that's to be used. Now, the Virginia Residential Landlord Tenant Act provides that the parties can select 
uh, they can select notice periods and uh, how notice can be given. So uh, the parties should specify how they want notice to be given. The last strategy is to have a rental application with a release signed by the applicant. All right, a lot of uh, cases I see the parties don't use rental applications. It's kind of informal. Uh, you know, they have the, uh, the potential tenant provide like a pay stub or they have them provide uh, their last year's taxes uh, and that's about it. It's kind of informal. It, it's, uh, rental application is, is important and in that rental application it will say what the tenant must provide. Uh, and typically uh, they have to provide a reference and you know th those are very hard to get. Uh, a lot of tenants uh, they can't get references because they don't have good relations with their prior landlords. That should tell you something. Uh, but you know, basically the application will say that, that they'll have to provide certain financial information and, and references. And then the last thing is that you need to develop a non-discriminatory selection process uh, and you should have this in writing with the factors considered in selecting a tenant and you should give weight to each factor that you use. Retain the selection factors in the event there is any allegation of discrimination. And I'll tell you that this issue of discrimination is uh, more prevalent today uh, when people, people are fighting to, to get properties and uh, even if they don't have, you know, financially they're not strong and they don't have references, if you don't rent to them, they sometimes say it's discrimination. So you need to consider this when you're representing a landlord. Now, the next section deals with agents' responsibility and liabilities. Uh, don't let your broker end up as a deep pocket in a lawsuit brought by the landlord you represented in a transaction. Now, typically, you know, agents receive one month of, uh, of rent. That's the compensation for finding a tenant. Uh, this may or may not be sufficient to part, d depending on the rent and it's negotiable. But no matter how much you are paid, your responsibilities are the same. Now again, a lease application, as, as I discuss, this is necessary. It should be signed by all potential tenants, requires social security numbers, employment information, and banking information. Prior references are very important but hard to get. The names and ages of all potential occupants should be on the application. Uh, this is very important because uh, the, uh, the NVR lease has a, a provision that says only the parties that are identified on the lease application have the right to occupy the premises. And th this is important because there's many cases that I have landlords complain that I have the, the tenant is renting out rooms, all right, and they don't want that. Well, you know, unless you have a provision and unless you do what's needed to be done, you're not going to be able to put that tenant out by terminating the lease unless you do everything that's required. Now, with regard to lease application, if the agent is responsible for verifying the information, uh, the landlord should include uh, that it should include the landlord is responsible for the cost of the verification, okay? Because sometimes you have to pay services to get information. That shouldn't come out of your fee. That should be paid by the landlord. That's a cost of doing the business. Uh, then the second point is a non-discriminatory selection process. This is important. Now, I will tell you that uh, if the landlord is accused of discrimination, the landlord is going to use the defense that I hired an agent to lease the property and I assume the agent did everything right. Uh, the agent then will have the burden of proving the process was non-discriminatory. And then also don't discriminate. Listings, uh, now th listings for properties that indicate no Section 8 applicants have been held to be discriminatory. Uh, there's a big realty company competes with Samson. They have been they have been charged twice in D.C. Uh, with regard to listings that say no Section 8 applications. Now in D.C., the Attorney General there says that that is discriminatory. 
I don't think it's discriminatory. I think it's just a factual information, but they consider it discriminatory. So you don't ha in include information like that. If you get someone that applies that wants Section 8, you just tell them, I'm um, sorry, the property is not approved for Section 8, but you don't advertise that fact. Okay, what are acceptable criteria for selecting a, a tenant? All right, there has to be stable employment, sufficient income from proven sources, good credit history and prior references, uh, number of persons expected to occupy the property, and no criminal history of violent crime or crimes against minors. Now, the, the law has changed a bit. You can't, you can't exclude someone with a criminal record, okay? But you can exclude them depending on the crime that's charged. So if it's a nonviolent financial crime, you probably can't exclude them. If it's a violent crime, you, 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 you may be able to exclude them. All right, the, the other thing that the agent has to do, the, the agent is going to prepare the form lease. You have to fill it out completely, use an addendum if necessary to address some of the issues we talked about. Specify how rent is paid and where rent is paid. A lot of times I go through the NVR lease and you know, it's a form lease, but there's spa spaces that need to be filled out, they're not filled out. You have to go through every page and make sure you do that. And you, and you need to specify where the rent is paid. If there's an address, if it has to be mailed, you should have the address where it's mailed. Now, execution of the lease. <coughs> in person by tenant is best. That's my, that's my opinion, all right? Face to face has advantages, uh, but sometimes that's not possible. You have people from out of state, so you have to use DocuSign. Uh, but a face to face meeting has benefits. The security deposit can be collected at that time. The walkthrough could be, collect, could, could be conducted at that time. And also, you get to meet the tenants. You get to see uh, who is moving into the property. Uh, I had a case one time that the, the parties were going to meet the landlord, uh, well, the, the landlord, the agent, and the potential tenants were supposed to meet to sign the lease. So on the lease, it was a husband and wife and two children. Well, at the meeting, a van pulled up, and there were four adults, and there were six children. So, and all the parties came into the office, and then at one point, a question was asked, uh, you know, who are these other people? Uh, oh, yeah, this is my brother-in-law and their kids, and they're going to live with us. Well. That's, that's not what the landlord wanted. The landlord wanted to rent that property to, to one family, not two families. So that was, that was advantageous. The landlord decided not to lease the property because it, they didn't want to lease the property to two families. So that face-to-face -face had some advantage. Now, an agent should also retain all rental applications and results of the walkthrough until expiration of the lease term or two years. Okay, and maintain, you need to maintain these files. The next point is, what, are, what is the scope of the agent's duties? Now, I was just uh, speaking with Mike Briggs earlier this morning, and we were discussing agent's duties. Now, typically, uh, if you have a management company that manages the property, the duties continue from the application process through the final walkthrough when the tenant moves out. If you don't have a management company, it's unclear unless the agent tells and specifies to the client that my duties are going to end at this time, at a certain time. And that's typically, you need to say that once the, uh, once the keys are given, once the keys are given to the tenant, after we conduct the five-day walkthrough, uh, my duties are over and that's it. Because what happens is that you know, the, the duties are split, really. They're split up. There's a time, time continuum. So there's the front end when you do the work, the application, the screening process, you, you, get, you get the tenant. The tenant occupies the premises, and at the end of the tenancy, the, uh, there's issues. There, you have to do a walkthrough at that time. Uh, you have to make sure all rent is paid. Uh, and uh, the the landlords sometimes assume, oh, my agent's going to do that, and they call their agent, and this is like a year later, or it can be longer. Sometimes there's a year lease, but you know, after, the, after a year lease 
expires, it goes month to month until either party terminates it with notice. So sometimes you have leases that these people have been there for five years. The, the agent has no idea, has forgotten totally about this, but the uh, landlord calls up and say, hey, well, what about this, what about that? Well, you know, the, 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 and the agent may rightfully not to want to get involved in this situation five years later. So it's very important that this is specified, you know, when your duties, when they are going to end. There should also be language that the agent promises best efforts, but you cannot guarantee the accuracy of information on any application or that the tenant will pay. A lot of times you have a situation where a tenant stops paying <coughs> and then the landlord goes back and says, well, you should have checked them out better, or you should have done this, or you should have done that. Well, the, the, the tenant needs to protect themselves, I'm, I'm sorry, the agent needs to protect themselves by, under, by making sure that their client understands they use their best efforts but there's no guarantees. Now, to conclude, in the past, much of what has been recommended here was not done. Some agents did little or no work other than having a tenant sign a lease and collecting one month's rent for their pay. Today, when a lease goes bad and a landlord spends money to remove a tenant in default with no good prospect of collecting damages from the tenant, the landlord may look for a deep pocket and sue your broker. So I, to conclude, be careful, but still make money. Thank you very much. And I'll take any questions now if there's any questions. Welcome, Joe. Thanks for coming. You guys can hear me OK? Uh, so Joe and everybody that's listening, uh, this your context today, I would say, is largely Virginia-based with the NVAR. That's correct. Lease documents and the um, VRLTA, Virginia Residential Landlord Tenant Act. But in a in a broader sense, most of what you've just spoken about, and there's lots more to talk about with landlord tenant considerations. But it's it's pretty applicable across jurisdictions overall. Right some of the recommendations you oh, just yeah. made. Oh, uh, yeah, a lot of the things with discrimination. Um, yeah, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. When it comes to anything new with post-COVID, we didn't dive into that too much yet. Um, would you say that any, any uh, relaxation of former uh, applicable statute or code sections under the VRLTA <coughs> Did, did the same take place in Maryland and D.C., to the best of your knowledge? And were there changes that we should be aware of, that, that you're aware of, that are now gone? I know it depends on... It depends on the jurisdiction. I, I will say this. I know this, that in each jurisdiction, D.C., Maryland, and Virginia, there was moratoriums on evictions. There were certain requirements put on landlords. Uh, and, and each jurisdiction did have that. Now, I, I cannot speak with regard to Maryland or D.C. if they have expired, if those moratoriums have expired or they're still in force. We know for a fact in Virginia it has expired and we're back to the old law. Sounds good. You spoke uh, briefly about agent responsibilities. This is one I get all the time on the rentals. We're not talking about property management accounts, just straight rental listings. I do believe, and I'll double check, I ask everybody to look at their listing agreements carefully, because you should be well aware, this is whether it's Virginia, Maryland, or DC, or we're now in Pennsylvania and West Virginia and Delaware. But make sure you understand what the brokerage agreement says when it comes to the brokerages and the listing agent's responsibilities once a lease is signed. Because right. I, I do believe that it's pretty clear in the NBAR listing agreement that our job is effectively, it, legally, our assignment is to produce a ready, willing, and able tenant acceptable to the landlord. And when they sign the lease, it's pretty much the transaction's over. But um, too many, too many agents don't remind their landlord to do that, to make sure that that check-in inspection is effectively done, and. I encourage all of our agents to go the extra mile as a full service standard agent and either, you know, be present, be present for that move in inspection to make sure that there is a condition report provided uh, 
or at least make sure that your landlord who is self-managing that property is going to get that done. Because uh, the, the NVAR lease, and I think this is backed up by VRLTA, requires the landlord himself or herself to provide an inspection report to the tenant, itemizing the condition of the property at time of occupancy, including right. any mold. visible evidence of mold. Right. And count, I would say probably more often than not, almost, it seems, uh, that's not really done. I, I, I don't, my experience has been, it's rarely done. <laughs> it's rarely done. And you know, if it's not done, what happens? Well, if the lease is smooth and there's no problems between the parties, well, not, it only comes up when there's, when there's uh, an issue, when there is a dispute um, between the parties. But I, 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 my experience is that it's not done. It's not done. Yeah, a lot of times listing agents seem to think that they can just uh, rely on the landlord to do what he needs to do. But uh, go the extra mile if you're a listing agent. Make sure that happens and not just expect the tenant. Everybody seems to think that it's, well, it's the tenant that doesn't want to be held accountable for existing issues, deficiencies with the property at the end of the lease. So it's really incumbent upon the tenant to put forth the itemized report. But that's not what it says in the lease. Yeah. Well, and the tenant won't, won't do it. I mean, or they don't do it well. And yeah, I mean, that's the, the landlord is hurting themselves if they don't do it because I mean, I, the, the carpet is a good example. Uh, I, I deal with many cases where at the end of the lease there's a dispute on the condition of the carpet. The landlord says the tenant has destroyed this carpet and I want it replaced. Well, uh, when you go to court, you know, there's two sides of the story. The, the, the tenant says, no, the carpet was old when I moved in and I had it cleaned before I moved out and that's it. So a lot of times, at least in Fairfax, what the judges do is they ask how old is the carpet? And there's a number of judges in Fairfax that say if the carpet is more than five years old, they won't give anything to the landlord, okay? Because they think that's like basically the, the working life of carpet in a, in a rental situation. Now, if you have on your walkthrough that brand new carpet, and then at the end of the walkthrough, you know, when you do the final walkthrough, carpet is horribly stained or, or, you know, damaged, landlord has a very good argument to get that carpet replaced because it was new, you know. So it's important. It's, and, and I said flooring is one of the biggest issues. Hardwood floors, scratching of hardwood floors, and carpeting, those are the biggest issues I see with the final walkthroughs and what landlords want and what, you know, what tenants might give. So on that same uh, subject, what I see a lot, and I, occasionally I'll get a call from a landlord who, it, who felt like his listing agent actually went too far in pointing out existing deficiencies, saying, you know, who are you working for here? Are you working for the tenant or are you working for me? And from a property management standpoint or just overall best practice in my opinion, of course the listing agent and the landlord don't have a duty to point out every little cosmetic defect. But in my experience, having a thorough itemized condition report is not only fair, because why should a tenant be held responsible down the road for items that are pre-existing, you know, where they could be held mm -hmm. hostage with the security deposit. But that comes up, and listing agents, it's a judgment call as to, you know, and sometimes there's a tenant rep agent present for the walkthrough, sometimes not. Sometimes it's just the, the tenant and the listing agent and the landlord or just, you know, uh, but no matter who's there, um, I think it's, it's best practice for the listing agent, even though, you know, we represent the landlord, but to have a thorough report because that's going to help minimize dispute, unnecessary right. dispute at the end. Right. So. I, I agree. I agree. And also, also reinforcing to the tenant what their obligations are. The uh, NVAR lease has a number of uh, requirements that the, uh, the tenant is supposed to comply with before they're moving out. You know, it says cleaning the carpet, professionally cleaning the carpet. Now, I, a lot of times it comes up, oh, I, I've rented a machine to clean the carpet. Well, you know, there's a dispute about that because it says professionally clean the carpet and provide a receipt. If they have a pet, you know, they have to uh, flee and detick, so they have to have that service. If it's a fireplace, they're supposed to clean the fireplace. 
I mean, this is rarely done. Uh, another dispute I see is with the exterior. Landlords say, oh, the bushes aren't trimmed and this, uh, uh, the lawn has died, they didn't water it, they didn't do this. And basically, the, you know, the, the landlord wants to charge the uh, tenant a couple thousand dollars to redo the landscaping. Probably not gonna fly. If you go to court, they're probably not going to get it, okay? So th these are the things that, uh, you know, that they should be discussed. I mean, if, if the uh, landlord is concerned about the exterior of the property, the landlord should say that the, you know, they should specify the grass needs to be cut every two weeks. Uh, or you know you need to maintain the you need to maintain the lawn. You need to have a service, and you know sometimes the landlord can get the service and the tenant pays for it. But uh, but they have to be discussed. If they're not discussed, uh, the landlord is often going to be disappointed because the tenant is not going to voluntarily do it. And you represent landlords in court. Most of the time. Sometimes Mo tenants too. So, sometimes tenants. Most of the time. Most of the time, landlords. Uh, you have to have. You have to have like a financially secure tenant, you know, that's usually like a hire an attorney to bring a lease, a lease dispute. Most of the time it's landlords that are, are, are you know, looking to recover money. And, and, the, and one thing I want to bring up, Mike, I think also if there is a problem, the landlord needs to act immediately. A, a lot of times I have people coming in and uh, I ask how much rent is due. And they say six months. And I say, why six months? Because, well, the, the, the tenant said he was going to pay me double next month or he was going to pay a little more each month. And they just kept dragging, dragging, dragging. And pretty soon it becomes a lot of money. And I will tell you, one of the things when I meet with a landlord, I tell the landlord, in most cases, it's very unlikely that you're going to recover the, the rent that's, that, that, that's due. Uh, you know, and maybe even the damages other than, you know, from the security deposit. It, it, it's unlikely, it's difficult, so don't count on it. So fast action is necessary. So if a, if a client reaches out to an agent and says, hey, I'm having this problem, if you need legal help, get legal help in early. Don't let it, don't let it sit there and don't let it build up. In your experience, um, so when, when you go to court, most landlord-tenant disputes initially are relatively small and get handled in small claims court or what they call landlord-tenant court? Well, in Virginia, in Virginia, it's a general district court. Uh, in Virginia, we do have a small, we have a small claims division, but small claims division does not have jurisdiction to handle landlord-tenant cases. The, the only division that has the, the, the power to do that is the general district court. Now, some some disputes can be handled in small claims because say for example if say the lease is over the tenant has moved out and the parties are fighting over the security deposit okay well that's just like a regular civil matter you can bring that in if it's under five thousand you can bring it in small claims court where the difference is is if the tenant is still on the property and the landlord wants to remove the tenant the landlord has to get what's called possession. It's called legal possession. And the court has to have jurisdiction to be able to do that, and the general district court has jurisdiction to give a writ of possession. And no attorneys are allowed in small claims court, that's right? That's right, that's so right. So general district is, if, right. you, if you have an attorney, that's where it's gonna be. Right, right. Now if you get sued, if you as a landlord get sued and the tenant files in uh, small claims court, you can hire an attorney and the attorney can file a, a motion to remove it to the general district court and that takes a lot of wind out of the tenant sales when they do that you know because you know uh, small claims court they have what's called relaxed rules of evidence so you know it, it, a lot of stuff can get in that won't get in in general district court so when they when people come to me and they have these cases they say well let's just remove it to general district court and it makes it a, a lot a lot more difficult so if there's a dispute, because we get this a lot from our landlord clients, what's the fastest practical process for eviction and getting a court date in Virginia, as long as the landlord acts quickly and sends proper notice, what right. would you say? Well, I, I think that it's at least eight weeks, but I mean, that's pretty fast. I mean, that's eight weeks from filing to like having the sheriff there putting them out, okay? So that's pretty fast. I mean, you won't get that in D.C. or Maryland. And by the time the sheriff 
is there to take them out if, if they haven't already vacated. Uh, then the court date, the hearing date, you don't, you don't get that without a hearing because you got to have a hearing first. Right. You, you, yeah. have to go, you have to go to court. You have to have your trial. Okay. At the trial, you know, hopefully the landlord gets a judgment for possession and a judgment for damages for the back rent. Okay. After that court date, there's a 10-day appeal period, so nothing can be done in the 10 days. After the 10 days, the landlord can get a writ of possession from the court. That is delivered to the sheriff, and the sheriff schedules an eviction. Now, there's two types of evictions that they do in Virginia. There's called a lock change, and then there's the eviction where you put all their property, you take all the property out of the house and you know, bring it to the curb. Now, I've, I've been involved in many, maybe 50 evictions. Uh, we, I always recommend you do the lock change, okay? With the lock change, what happens is that the landlord has to show up with a locksmith. The sheriff comes to the property at the, spe at the specified time, and then he's, he clears the house. He knocks on the door. If, if the tenant is there and opens up, the sheriff says what's going on. He tells the tenant to come outside. The locksmith changes the locks and gives the new keys to the uh, landlord, and the tenant has eight hours to move their property out out of the house. If it's not moved out within eight hours, then it becomes the property of the landlord. It's considered abandoned, and it, the landlord can do with it what, what they want. Now, I usually recommend to a landlord, if the tenant is making progress, you know, they're moving their stuff out, and, but at the end of eight hours, there's still some stuff there, give the tenant some more time, because it's cheaper to do that than for you to have to pay a service to haul away the junk. So. Uh, that's, but, but that's the type of eviction. The other type of eviction where, uh, where the property is moved, it's much more expensive for the landlord because what you have to do is that the landlord has to hire a moving company to come and uh, then that moving company moves everything outside, puts it on the, on the curb in that type of eviction. So uh, the lock change is, a, is a m much more popular, much more popular. Can I keep asking questions? <laughs> a couple more. Um, <clears throat> trying to keep it relevant. And again, uh, we have people listening in, zooming in, or will be, that are uh, more Maryland-based or D.C.-based. And we encourage uh, everybody to reach out to local council, to their local association of realtors council, or other private attorneys. Um, and I can recommend some attorneys in Maryland at D.C. if necessary. Um, when it comes to this source of funds, this, the law relating to a protected class source of funds, in, that's Virginia only, right? As far as you know, this, it, this became effective, I think, last year. Was it maybe July or two years ago? The uh, source of funds, it's Section 8 being yeah, Section the, eight, most, yeah, okay, yeah, the most common yes, uh, Section 8 is the most common. Now, I, I'm going to say that I, I've not had any... Uh, I've not seen any cases in Virginia that any cases have been brought by, uh, by the, the state of Virginia against anyone you know, for saying that they're disc discriminating because they say no Section 8 applications. D.C. definitely will, will prosecute for that. D.C., yeah. <coughs> and and fed you know, it's federal fair housing, but, also, but, but source of funds is not one of the seven protected classes under federal. I think it it was made a protected class in Virginia, and we'll see how it all shakes out. But um, and, and I, a landlord doesn't have to take just so. Sometimes landlords get scared, and they say, "Oh, I have to." You know, for Section Eight, you have to be uh, the property has to be inspected by the county, and it has to be approved for Section Eight. You have to go through a process, and uh, then you know, with the benefit of Section Eight, is that the county the county pays a certain amount part of the rent and then the tenant only pays a smaller part. So, uh, so the landlord is kind of guaranteed payments. But, but typically, uh, you know, the, the Section 8 properties are the, uh, the older, like, garden condominiums. They're, they're the less expensive, less desirable properties. We've had landlords that have done really, really well and say, yeah, I welcome Section 8 uh, applicants. And then we have others that, you know, are leery of it, bad experience they've had, or they're just fearful. I did want to ask you if you're if you're able to comment. My understanding, which may not be correct, but I think it is in Virginia, is that 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 source of funds issue, including the ability to 
turn away Section 8 out of hand if that's what the landlord wants to do. Is It applies technically only to landlords uh, who own more than four properties. Is that your understanding or do you know? Under VRLTA, yeah. if you own less, <coughs> if you own four or, l or fewer, I think there's an exception. Yeah, you know, I'm not certain on that, Mike, but I will say that that, that cutoff, that, that owning less than four, uh, it does, there's certain, there's certain requirements that don't apply because those are considered small landlords. And there's other, uh, there's other requirements that apply to larger landlords. Now, I'm not, I'm not certain uh, on that particular point. We'll have to check on that. Okay. Um, well, I guess we're, unless you have final comments about COVID-related or, uh, I, I'll wrap it up with one more recommendation to our people. I always, when I'm talking to disgruntled landlords and I'm talking to our listing agents, I advise the landlords to look upon their tenant, their tenants, try to look upon them as like business partners, business assets. Uh, it's a two-way street and, you know, uh, what I don't like to see is listing agents automatically sort of enabling landlords um, to get over on their tenants or to be real stingy, real cheap. Uh, you know, if you treat your tenant with respect, uh, they're more likely to take care of your property and pay pay the rent on time, right? Well, I think, I think, I think that's true. And, and I, I think that's a good point. Like with regard to repairs, <clears throat> I have a lot of cases that I get, you know, I get, uh, I get tenants that call me and say, well, you know, the air conditioning hasn't been working for two weeks and, you know, I keep calling the landlord and he sent something and they played with it and it worked for, worked for a few days and it didn't. And, you know, they, they want to stop paying the rent. Now, w what I tell them is that landlord has a reasonable time to make repairs. Okay, that's what the law is, a reasonable time. The law doesn't say 24 hours, five days, whatever. It says a reasonable time to make repairs. Now, a reasonable time is going to depend on other conditions too. You know, typically air conditioners don't fail in the winter time. They fail when it's the hottest part of the year, okay? So, so and also the AC technicians are the busiest at that time of the year. So it's not uncommon that you call up and you want service, okay, we'll be there two weeks. So, so what I told the, I, what I told the tenant is I said, well, they, they, they have a reasonable time, and I explained it in the situation. The tenant understood that, and I said, just keep working with the landlord. And I said, pay your rent. I said, uh, and, you know, hopefully it works out. But I, I agree with you. You should try to maintain it as a business relationship. You know, you're providing property. They're providing income for you. So, you know, have a cooperative relationship instead of an uh, adversary relationship. Got another one that popped into my brain. Joe, you talked about uh, in Virginia, the maximum <coughs> security deposit is the equivalent of two months rent. That's correct. Do you know if that is, if they have a separate pet deposit, it, would it be cumulative or do you know if, if it could be uh, I two think months the pet, rent? I think the pet deposit could be added to that. In addition. In addition, right. pet deposit, because yeah, pet deposit, it, it could be added to that. And then when it comes to prepaid rent, um, my understanding is that in Virginia, prepaid rent is totally okay. There's no, nothing in the law that says a landlord cannot accept six months in advance or the full year, the full lease term up front. They got to put it in an escrow account. It has to be put in an escrow account. It's a little bit cumbersome. It has to be put in an escrow account and before the landlord withdraws, you know, a month payment, they have to clear it with the tenant. So basically they have to send an email, so I'm saying I'm going to take you know, this month's rent out of the escrow account and they and the tenant has to approve it. So it's a little bit cumbersome. Or maybe it could be agreed that there's an automatic monthly draft from that account, you know, it's in the lease terms, that right. <clears throat> the prepaid rent's paying, being deposited in an escrow account out of which it'll be transferred electronically on a monthly basis when the rent becomes due. So I'll make sure you put that in an addendum. Um, okay, I would do that. And it, <laughs> I've been asked, well, who can be the escrow agent? The landlord can set up his own separate account, right? It's just right. It's a, right. Escrow, you don't need a third party, but it has to be, it has to be, you can't commingle the money, okay? So you have to go to the bank and you have to open an account and you have to say, you know, special account or escrow account uh, and then just keep the money there. You have to keep it, at least that's what the law says. It has to be identified, it has to be separate. Great, great. Well, Joe, that's all I've got. 
Um, and Justin, nobody's, nobody's chatted in at this point? Okay. If anybody out there who watches this has questions, um, reach out to me and or to Joe. I think uh, Joe's contact info may be on the, the beginning or end of the screen. If yeah, not, Joe, yeah. you want to tell people how to reach you? Yeah, I think it's on, on the, the handout here. Let's go. I think I have it on the front. I think I have my address. I have my phone number. Uh, and Phil, yeah, I mean, definitely, uh, if you're an agent, call and identify yourself. Say you're with Samson. And, you know, I won't, there's no charge. I'll talk to Samson people. Okay, I've always done that. I've known Mike for a long time. And I've dealt with a lot of Samson agents. So just call, call my office. The phone number's on the front page. And uh, a lot of times, sometimes with the issues, I, I, you know, they're, they're a general question. I could give you an answer right away. And, I, you know, and if I can do that, you know, like I said, that's courtesy to Samson agents. Terrific. And this uh, PowerPoint will be up on the nest along with the video. Thank you, Justin, and thank you, Joe. We look forward to seeing you again. Thank soon. you, Mike. Bye-bye.